Amy Loughran worked as a nurse in the intensive care unit at the Somerset Medical Center in New Jersey from 2001 to 2004. Her job was to look after the critically ill patients. In 2003, Amy was a single mother working day and night to provide for her two daughters. She worked in the ICU with two other nurses, Donna Hargreaves and Charlie Collin. Charlie, Donna, and Amy were inseparable. They were even called the Three Musketeers by their colleagues in the hospital. They often spent time together after work and soon became good friends. Charlie was an indispensable member of the team, jokingly referred to by his colleagues as a gift from the scheduling gods as he took every shift and never asked to switch. In addition, he was remarkably knowledgeable about medicine, knowing the name and use of almost every drug. The entire department came to him for advice. To Amy, he seemed a little withdrawn, as he had been bullied in the past, but he was a good friend nonetheless. Like her, he was a parent and also divorced. Charlie was very kind to Amy and once even helped her to save her career. Amy was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, a serious heart condition, but afraid of losing her job at the hospital, she kept her condition secret while at work. One day, her heart started playing up during her shift. Charlie noticed this and produced a couple of tablets of cardism from somewhere to give to her. After that, he took care of her patients all evening and never told anyone her secret. One night in the summer of 2003, an elderly priest named Florian Gall was admitted to the intensive care unit. Florian had wanted to become a member of the clergy since he was a boy. He dreamed of helping people and in adulthood, he realized that dream. He was a wonderful friend and brother. His sister sat at his bedside for days on end, waiting for him to recover. He was admitted to the hospital after complaining of the heaviness in his chest. It became difficult for him to breathe, so the nurses had to feed him oxygen through a tube. He had pneumonia. Despite his quite serious condition, he was stable and soon started to improve. After some time, he was even transferred from the ICU. Everyone hoped to be able to send him home soon. A few days after Florian's improvement, Amy learned that his heart had suddenly stopped and he had died. At first, she didn't think much of it. Unfortunately, these things happened quite often in her line of work, especially in her department. However, the results of Father Gall's blood test were strange, to say the least. Besides that, he was not the first to die in such a way. He was named patient number four. Something was clearly not quite right here. After Florian Gall's death, the nurse who found his blood test called the New Jersey Poison Control Center. Dr. Stephen Marcus picked up the phone and recorded his conversation with the nurse. She was curious about the drug digoxin, which is used for a variety of heart conditions. The test showed that there was a significant amount of this drug in the deceased clergyman's blood, but there shouldn't have been any. He definitely hadn't been prescribed this medicine in the days before his death. Dr. Marcus said that such things don't happen and suggested writing off the strange test results as a lab error. But then something prompted him to ask if there had been any other strange deaths at Somerset Medical Center. The nurse thought for a second and remembered a few more cases. There had been other overdoses of this drug and also sudden deaths due to a sharp drop in blood sugar levels. The toxicologist responded immediately, call the police. However, when the nurse went to the management of the medical center and told them about this phone call, they decided to conduct their own investigation before going to the police. Shortly after, the concerned toxicologist called the center to check on the progress of the investigation, but they didn't tell him anything. He was sure that there was a serial poisoner working there, but another three months passed before Somerset Medical Center finally contacted the police to conduct an official investigation. During that time, five more patients had suddenly died. On October 3, 2003, Two Somerset police detectives, Tim Brown and Danny Baldwin, learned that the suspicious death of a patient was being investigated at the local medical center. The detectives requested to meet with representatives of the hospital. 
it turned out that, in fact, there had been four suspicious deaths. Two, due to a sharp drop in blood sugar or hypoglycemia. And two, due to an unexplained overdose of digoxin. The medical center's risk manager and spokeswoman, Mary Long, told the police that their internal investigation had not turned up anything suspicious. She handed the police some of the documents that the center had managed to collect during their investigation. Checking through these documents, the detectives noticed that one name came up several times, Charles Collin. Either he had been in the hospital on the day of the death, or had ordered medicine shortly before, or he was connected in some other way with each death. The medical center's management apparently did not consider this strange. But the police decided to find out more about this Charles Collin and why his name was lit up in the documents. As it happened, he was already known to the police. He had been arrested twice for DUI and once for trespassing on private property. But that had nothing to do with medicine, so the police were not satisfied. Next, they called the hospital he had worked at before and were told that Collins' file had already attracted attention from the police. That was in Pennsylvania, and a detective there had even left his phone number. They called this detective and discovered that Colin had been seriously suspected of murder in the hospital there, but nothing could be proven. The detectives discovered that from 1991 and 1994, Colin worked as a nurse at Warren Hospital in Pennsylvania. In fact, he was a man who changed jobs frequently. By 2003, he had already worked in nine different hospitals and one nursing home. The detectives also learned from his acquaintances that he sometimes abused the family pets, and once even poisoned one of them. It was at Warren Hospital, however, where he attracted the serious interest of law enforcement for the first time. The story went like this. An elderly woman named Helen Dean, who lived with her son Larry, was admitted to Warren Hospital. She was recovering from an operation to remove breast cancer and was about to be transferred to a rehab center. Larry was visiting his mother one evening when a nurse came into the room and asked him to leave. Larry obediently went out, but soon after he heard his mother screaming. Rushing back into the room, he was horrified. His mother told him that she had been given an injection against her will. Larry always carried a pocket knife with him, which included a small magnifying glass in it. He closely examined the place his mother indicated, and indeed, he saw a needle mark there. When Helen was transferred to the rehab center, she passed away. Larry immediately went to the police and explained that his mother had most likely been killed by that nurse. Helen's blood was analyzed for the unusual presence of any drugs except for digoxin. After this incident, Colin, who was under suspicion because the son of the deceased remembered him well, wanted to quit and never work in a medical institution again. But soon enough, he was back to work. The detectives, digging around like archaeologists, tried to find at least one solid case so they could arrest Colin. But nothing turned up. Helen was believed to have died of natural causes. So the detectives decided to call the New Jersey Poison Control Center, the one which had recently received a call from a nurse concerning the drug digoxin. The police didn't know anything about her call, so they were very surprised when Dr. Marcus, who answered the phone, asked if they were calling regarding Somerset Medical Center. The toxicologist explained that he had been sure for several months already that a killer was in operation at the medical center. Within 15 minutes of this call, the detectives arrived at the Poison Control Center to meet with Dr. Marcus. In the end, though, Somerset Medical Center were not cooperative with the police and refused to share everything. They even tried to cover up Colin's actions. Remember how Colin had come under suspicion in Pennsylvania? That case was at Warren Hospital, but it turned out that besides that case in 2002, another nurse, Pat Medellin, from St. Luke's Hospital, had also gone to the police with her concerns. Apparently, she had found evidence that her colleague, Charles Collin, was killing patients. She decided to make a list of all the suspicious deaths at the hospital. There were 67, and Charles Collin had been present in 40 of the deaths. He could be responsible for 40 lives. One of the patients who died unexpectedly while Collin was working at St. Luke's was a man named Sam. 
Pat Medellin had been his nurse. The man's condition was already improving when his heart suddenly stopped. After learning of Pat's mini investigation, the hospital's administration simply fired Colin. And that was the end of it. When they found out all this, the police realized they had to get their hands on Colin as soon as possible. They continued to gather information about him. For example, it was important to get a printout from the machine that dispenses medicines to hospital employees. This would give the police direct evidence that their suspect was in possession of the lethal drugs. In the New Jersey hospital at first, they said that all the information had been deleted from the machine, so it would be impossible to get the printouts. But then in the end, they changed their minds and somehow managed to restore the information and print it out. Anyhow, this gave the police strong evidence that Colin was indeed getting digoxin from the dispensing machine at the time of the mysterious deaths. But this was still not enough to arrest him and put him on trial. At the very least, the police wanted to get Colin fired as soon as possible to prevent him from killing any more patients. They did some digging around until they found their reason. Colin had lied on his resume, so he was dismissed. Meanwhile, the detectives were talking to Colin's acquaintances and colleagues in the hospital. However, this didn't turn up any results. Mary Lund, the woman who had been in charge of the internal investigation, was present at all the interviews. However, when the time came to interview Amy, Colin's friend and fellow nurse, the detectives had a stroke of luck. Mary Lund had to leave the office for a moment, and this became a golden opportunity. During the interview, Amy did not even want to hear any accusation against her friend. Charlie actually saved my life, Amy later told journalists. She had cardiomyopathy and needed an operation, but it was too expensive, and the insurance that would cover the cost depended entirely on her job at the hospital. She often worked night shifts to earn more money. Charlie sympathized with her and helped her out by taking over some of her responsibilities. He even helped Amy to hide her illness from her bosses and babysat her children from time to time. He was a close friend. However, when Amy was left alone with the detectives, they quietly handed her the printout of records from the drug dispensing system. As she looked it over, she suddenly remembered an incident. One of Amy's patients suddenly went into cardiac arrest and she ran to help. When she entered the room, she saw Colin injecting the woman. She asked what he was giving her. He replied, lidocaine. It seemed strange to Amy that Colin was giving the patient lidocaine, but she didn't have time to think about it. We need to save this woman, was her only thought. She started giving CPR. Other doctors and nurses ran into the room and one doctor asked in horror, who gave this woman lidocaine? For some reason, Amy said that she gave the injection and the doctor replied in alarm, she's allergic to lidocaine. Remembering this event in front of the detectives who were investigating Colin's suspected crimes, Amy started to look at things in a different light. Seeing that Amy was coming round, the police asked her to assist them. They were so close, she might be able to help them make the case. Amy got interested in understanding all this for herself. She spent days analyzing the medical records and teaching the detectives how to use the computerized system which would help them reconstruct Colin's activities on his shifts. She also agreed to record her phone conversations with the suspect. The realization that patients might be dying at the hands of Colin was accompanied by horror at the thought that he could harm her and her children. The clinic's management tried to intimidate her, but now she knew that she had to help the police put Colin behind bars. The decision was made to exhume the body of Father Gall. If there were any traces of digoxin in his blood, the police would have indisputable proof. And indeed, traces were found, so his cause of death was changed to murder. Meanwhile, Charlie Collin wasted no time. He got a job at another medical center. He was accepted everywhere despite the suspicions at his previous jobs. Basically, nobody had heard about his suspicious activities and there was no time to do a proper background check since there was a huge shortage of staff. 
The detective's next step was to listen in to conversations between Amy and Colin, in the hope that he would confess to her. Amy met him with a listening device strapped to her back that would relay the conversation back to the police in real time. The meeting took place in a cafe. Worried and anxious, Amy asked Colin for an honest answer. What did he have to do with the deaths at the hospital? She noticed how her friend's face changed instantly. He didn't look like himself anymore. He turned pale and his eyes went blank. There was no anxiety or fear or rage in them, only emptiness. He said, I want to go down fighting. This, along with other circumstantial evidence, was enough to bring Colin in for 24 hours for questioning. But during these first interrogations, he just hugged his knees and said absolutely nothing. So the detectives once again requested Amy for help. They asked her to talk to him again, and she decided that she would get the confession whatever it took. Amy reminded Colin that he had always saved her in the past, and that whatever happens, she would always appreciate and love him as a friend. Seeing that Colin was pleased to hear this, she asked him to save her one more time. She told him that she was now also under suspicion as his accomplice. And she asked him one simple question. How did you kill Father Gall? I gave him a shot of dejoxin, Colin replied. Thus began the confession. At the start of the interrogation, the police were just hoping for a single confession. They weren't prepared for what happened next. Colin kept going telling them about more and more murders in different states and in different hospitals. Amy was standing in the next room, watching her friend on a monitor. At one point, he explained how he often injected lethal drugs into IV drips, which were then taken to the patients by his colleagues, Amy included. One of the drugs he used was the paralytic vacuronium. A person who receives a dose of this drug starts to slowly die while remaining conscious. They understand what is happening to them, but they have no way of escaping or calling for help. In total, Colin admitted responsibility for the deaths of 30 to 40 people. Why did he do all this? What prompted him to kill people in hospitals, the safest places? Let's dive into his biography and look for clues and motivations there. Charles Collin was born on February 22, 1960 in the suburb of West Orange in the state of New Jersey. He was the youngest of eight children, two of whom later died. One of a drug overdose, the other committed suicide. Charles' father did not live long either. He worked as a bus driver, and at the time of the birth of his youngest son, he was 56 years old. He died on September 17, 1960, when little Charlie was barely seven months old. Charlie's mother was a simple housewife called Florence. She was the only one who could protect the boy from the harsh reality that surrounded him. His older brothers and sisters, while already living in different houses and cities, still came home often, bringing with them their friends and partners, and drugs and alcohol. Little Charlie saw it all. The only ray of light for the boy in this sad story was his mother, who quietly tried her best to protect him from the aggressions of the grown man who came to visit her daughters. It certainly wasn't an easy life for Charlie. At the age of nine, he tried to commit suicide by drinking chemicals from his children's chemistry kit. This would be the first of his many attempts to end his life. As his future colleague Amy correctly guessed, he was bullied at school. He was a quiet boy, so he just endured everything. But his trials didn't end here. On December 6, 1977, when Colin was 17, his mother died in a car accident. Behind the wheel was one of his teenage sisters, who suffered from epilepsy. It was a head-on collision. Charlie's mother was taken to the morgue at Mountside Hospital. They called Charlie from there to tell him what had happened. However, they didn't tell him that she hadn't survived. He rushed to the hospital and started looking for his mother, believing that she was still alive. It's hard to imagine what he experienced when he learned that not only was she no longer living, but that her remains had already been disposed of. He didn't even get the chance to say goodbye. This tragedy changed Cullen forever. 
he dropped out of school and once more tried to take his own life. In April 1978, Cullen entered the US Navy. He was assigned to serve on an aircraft carrier, Woodrow Wilson. He found himself in this role. In time, the young man even managed to become a petty officer. During his years of service, he liked to help the ship's doctor give injections. For some reason, he was fascinated by this process. Once he took over from the doctor for an entire shift, dressed up in a doctor's uniform and gloves that he stole from the medicine cabinet. After some time, Charles was transferred to another ship, where he served the rest of his duty until March 30, 1984, when he was fired for health reasons. It's not difficult to guess what the problem was, given his history of suicide attempts and his alcohol addiction. He was rumored to even drink mouthwash. His colleagues made fun of him. Charles, depressed by this bullying, tried to take his life again. He spent a total of six years in the service before returning to New Jersey. Then he went to nursing school in the same hospital where his mother passed away. Charlie was the only male student on the entire course, 88 students in total. He even became a student representative. He paid for the course by flipping burgers in various fast food restaurants and met his future wife. Adrian Taub had just graduated from college with a degree in business. Charlie noticed her and began to overwhelm her with gifts. After just six months, he proposed. They got married in 1987, for which Charlie renounced the Catholic faith and converted to Judaism. Although later, he would be completely disappointed by all religion. The couple had two daughters, Shauna and Saskia. A year later, Colin got his first job at a hospital. He began his career in the burns unit at St. Barnabas Medical Center. This is not the most pleasant place for a nurse just starting out a career in medicine. Even for experienced paramedics, spending days and nights in the burns unit can hardly be called a desirable job. Charlie, however, fell at ease there. His job was to clean the burned patients on a metal table with antibacterial soap and a brush. In general, the burns unit is an awful place to be both for doctors and obviously for patients. At that time, painkillers were less developed than they are now, and morphine was prescribed to newly arrived patients. When someone died, it was not always possible to determine whether the person had died from the burns themselves or from a morphine overdose. Colin worked there for four years until one particular incident. The hospital management, puzzled by the frequent insulin overdoses occurring in Colin's department, discovered injection holes and huge doses of insulin in the saline IV bags. Suspicions fell on Colin. You can't prove anything. I don't have to talk to you, he told the investigators. They tried to catch him as best as they could, even installing cameras with motion sensors in the warehouses. They interrogated doctors, medical workers, and even visitors who had been in those departments where the overdoses happened. Cullen was fired in January 1992, but the hospital did not involve the police. They didn't want to create a scandal. Interestingly, after his departure, the series of insulin overdoses ended. But nobody continued the investigation, because St. Barnabas was the biggest employer in Livingstone and the main source of tax payments to the city's treasury. If the hospital was involved in a scandal, the whole city would be impacted. This was apparently the logic followed by the hospital's administration, who decided to stay quiet about the issue. Colin, meanwhile, calmly went off to find work in another medical facility, Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg. So Charlie got a stable job at last, but now the problems in his personal life began. In January 1993, Adrian filed for a divorce. She and Colin had already begun to drift apart from one another. They worked different shifts, he most often took night shifts, and even slept separately. In addition, she had twice gone to the police with reports of domestic violence, and she long suspected her husband of abusing their dogs. One time, Colin left one of their daughters in the unlocked house while he went out for a walk. When Adrian later asked him how he could think of leaving their child alone with the door open, in the same way as once their puppy ran away and got lost, he replied that he was sure that their daughter wouldn't wake up. Had he drugged her with something? Adrian had already argued with him about using drugs, but he just brushed it off. 
Another frightening tale was about the neighbor's dog, which often came over to their place, until one day it simply vanished. Later, it was found dead. Adrian used to say to her friends, you know, I think there's something seriously wrong with Charlie. There were so many of these strange incidents. For example, one day Adrian came home to find that Colin had cut out all the boys from a photo of their daughter's kindergarten. Why would he do that? Adrian tried not to think that her husband could be doing all of this intentionally. She just wanted him to stay away from her and her children. She requested a restraining order from the police, and she got it. But Colin never physically harmed her or the girls, so in the end, Adrian got custody while Charles was still allowed to communicate with them. Right around when they were preparing the divorce papers, Adrian needed a gallbladder operation and ended up at Warren Hospital where Colin was working. She made sure that he came nowhere near her. Her father was keeping guard at her bedside day and night. She didn't know that Colin was killing patients, but she guessed that he was probably doing some dark stuff. Another notable story occurred in March 1994. The police received yet another complaint about Colin. This time, he broke into a nurse's apartment. Her name was Michelle Tomlinson, and Colin had been trying to get closer to her and even hoped to start a family with her. He broke in when she was at home with her child and was avoiding his obsessive attempts at courtship. The woman was sleeping, but Charlie could not believe that she had rejected him. He was hoping to marry her, so he called her up and drove around her house several times, trying to understand if she was at home or not. In the end, he broke into her house, but she didn't wake up. In the morning, he confessed everything to her and was given a year of probation. Charlie wanted to leave his job after this incident, but he still had to pay child support for his two daughters, so he continued to work at the hospital. Meanwhile, his alcohol problems persisted. In spite of all of this, he was even admitted to psychiatric institutions several times. He still had no problems finding work, all because of the lack of junior medical staff throughout the country. Employers simply could not check his work history, or even the fact that he had been admitted to hospitals because of his suicide attempts. At that time, there was no register of medical employees with mental health problems. Once, Cullen was even called and asked to return to his shift straight from the psychiatric hospital. When Cullen left his job at Warren Hospital, he moved to the intensive care and cardiology department at Hunter Don Medical Center in Flemington. But following the sudden and suspicious death of the 91-year-old Helen Dean from heart failure, Charles quit again. He then had a brief stint of work at Morristown Memorial Hospital, but was fired in August 1997 for poor performance at work. Despite this, he then easily landed a job at the Liberty Care and Rehabilitation Center in Allentown. The salary was small and his alimony debts were growing, but Cullen wasn't going to change his profession anytime soon. Apparently, there was something about the work that attracted him, beyond the money or a desire to help people. In October 1998, he was fired again when the hospital found out that he was giving patients unprescribed drugs. Over the next two years, Charles worked at three more hospitals. From November 1998 to March 1999, he worked at Easton Hospital. In that time, he fell under suspicion in the death of a patient named Omar Schramm, who was found dead with a high dose of digoxin in his blood. Then a colleague at St. Barnabas Hospital in Allentown discovered a stash of unused drugs in a trash can. These were drugs that couldn't be sold, nor taken for a recreational use. It was discovered that the stash belonged to Colin, who was then fired in June 2002. In September of that year, Colin left Allentown and got a job as a nurse in the intensive care unit at the Somerset Medical Center in his home state of New Jersey. But he wouldn't stay there for long. As we know, he was suspected of giving patients drugs that no one had prescribed them and possibly causing them to overdose on insulin and digoxin intentionally. On October 31st, Colin was fired for lying on his resume, just an excuse to get rid of this dangerous nurse and avoid causing a scandal throughout the country. But finally, of course, a scandal could not be avoided. Charles Colin appeared before the court. He escaped the death penalty only because of his cooperation with the investigation. On March 2, 2006, he was sentenced to 11 life terms. On March 10, a further six sentences were added. 
He is currently serving his sentence with no possibility of parole in a state prison in New Jersey. Investigators on the inside of the case believe that Cullen may be responsible for the deaths of up to 400 patients, making him the most prolific serial killer in history. Why wasn't he caught earlier, and why did the hospital stay silent? Probably all of the hospitals were terribly afraid of any bad publicity. Not a single prospective patient would come to a hospital with a reputation for strange deaths in the ICU, so they kept their mouths shut. The killer said that he believed that he was helping patients and spoke of how he could not bear to watch them suffer. He told the homicide detectives Dan Baldwin and Tim Brown that he committed the first of his many murders in the burns unit at St. Barnabas Medical Center. The victim was Judge John W. Yango Sr., who was hospitalized after an allergic reaction to blood thinning drugs. According to another version of events, he had a severe sunburn. Charles sent the man from this world in June 1988 by injecting him with a lethal dose of insulin. At Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg, he allegedly killed three elderly women by injecting them with a large dose of the cardiac glycoside, digoxin. In the intensive care and cardiology ward at Hunter Don Medical Center in Flemington, Cullen killed five more patients over three years. Amy visited Charles in prison, but only until 2013. Then Charles Graber's book about the Kames came out. It describes each case in great detail as well as going into Cullen's biography in depth. I read it, but it's simply unrealistic to try to fit all the interesting details in a single video like this. Actually, Amy hadn't wanted her name to appear in the book. He hasn't responded to my letters since the book came out. He didn't know that I was working for the New Jersey Attorney's Office until the book came out. Charles Graber, the book's author and a former medical student, spent seven years researching about the Cullen case. He titled the book The Good Nurse. He also had personal contact with Cullen more than a dozen times. When asked why the hospitals didn't check the background of the new employee, Graber replied, Well, partially because they weren't required to, and partially because there was a nursing shortage on. Charles Cullen looked good. By the end of his career, he was a 16-year veteran. He had recommendations. And for a hospital to ask too much or say too much became a liability. You can't penalize a nurse for seeking counseling, for seeking treatment, for going to a rehab center successfully. And so because of that, Charlie hid in those shadows. Why didn't Amy notice Charlie's strange behavior and stop him? She felt a huge sense of guilt for not preventing all those deaths. It was the most devastating moment of my entire life. And not really so much about knowing that one of my closest friends was murdering people, because how do you process that? But I hadn't protected these people. They were my patients. They were all of the patients at Somerset Medical Center of the nurses I worked with, and not only were we in charge of their medical safety, we were in charge of them. Amy tried to understand why her friend started killing in the first place. Was his psychology to blame? I learned a lot about my friend Charlie, and it scared the hell out of me after I read the book, because I really didn't know. The conversations we had led me to believe that it was an obsessive-compulsive disorder gone awry. I think it was just an extreme and an obsession for him. He felt a compulsion to kill. That compulsion started very early on in his childhood, but he started poisoning people before he was even a teenager. Amy knew that, despite all the evidence to the contrary, many held the opinion that Charles killed his victims out of compassion for their suffering. But this was not the case. Some of them were already preparing to be discharged, but even Amy thought this way at first. It was somehow a way to justify it, because the truth was too scary. Colin's youngest victim was only 21 years old. The author of The Good Nurse had his own theory about Colin's motives, which he explained in an interview with USA Today. One of his motives was because he could. It made him feel special and empowered, and it blew off steam. He didn't understand the human cost or care. The other reason he would give was that he was compelled to intervene. He framed some of the murders as acts of mercy, or that he felt compelled because of the circumstances of the individuals. But really, that compulsion had everything to do with his needs, and nothing to do with the needs or the wishes of the innocent patients. 
Of course, changes in the law followed. Hospitals now face more severe penalties for failing to report suspicious deaths. And now, a new junior medical staff are now required to undergo a criminal record check and give biometric fingerprint data. In 2013, Colin gave an interview to CBS in which he spoke about his 20 suicide attempts and the crimes he had committed. I worked on the burn unit, so I mean there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, and I didn't cope with that as well as I thought I would. There was no justification. The only thing I can say is that I felt overwhelmed at the time. I thought that people weren't suffering anymore, and so in a sense, I thought I was helping. This interview became a real sensation. Colin claimed that at least two of the hospitals were aware of what he had done. Well, I think you can say I was caught at St. Barnabas and I was caught at St. Luke's. There was no reason that I should have been a practicing nurse after that. They said, if you resign, we'll give you neutral references. And I decided to go with that. Charles felt that his dismissal from these positions without prosecutions or charges was due to the hospital's concerns about a scandal. Lawsuits for millions of dollars would ensue, so they chose to remain silent to avoid this. Somerset Medical Center told Colin that he was fired in the evening, but even while suspecting him, the hospital management insisted that he work for one more shift. Fortunately, as Charles admitted to reporters, he didn't harm anyone that night. Another interesting and unexpected twist is the fact that according to New York Magazine, Colin received a newspaper clipping with the story of a man in need of a kidney operation. The clipping came along with a handwritten note, Can you help? The man in trouble was Ernie Packham, a husband and a father of four who worked as a metal worker. Ernie was the brother of Colin's ex-girlfriend, who was also the mother of Colin's youngest child, a daughter that he never saw. Packham contracted streptococcus in 2002, and the infection spread to both of his kidneys. He was put on a waiting list for a transplant, with the expectation that he could wait up to seven years for a kidney. His mother, Pat Packham, secretly cut out the article and mailed it to Cullen in prison. Charles did the necessary blood tests and turned out to be the perfect donor for Ernie. Still awaiting sentencing, Cullen wanted to be an anonymous donor so that the news of his involvement would not spread to the media but someone leaked the story to the press. Later, Cullen's lawyer was told that he could donate the organ only after the trial in December 2005. Two counties in Pennsylvania were still completing investigations into his crimes, which led to a significant delay in sentencing. His lawyer explained, that's why on January 10th, Charlie stopped cooperating with the prosecution, saying, sentence me now. It forced their hand. We realized that by the time they finished, Ernie might be dead. Charles was finally allowed to donate his kidney in August 2006. As for the convict's relatives, neither Taub nor her daughters have spoken publicly about their past or current relationship with Colin or their thoughts on his heinous crimes. They've stayed out of the public eye following the release of the Netflix movie. There are even unconfirmed reports that both Saskia and Shauna might officially change their names. While we may never know the real motive behind Charles Collins' crimes, we do know that his imprisonment prevented the deaths of even more patients. Indeed, in one interview he said, I don't know if I would have stopped. And what do you think about this case? Have you heard any other interesting details? Did you like the Netflix movie based on the story? I thought it was an excellent depiction of the case, but only if you already know how it really happened. And what do you think? Do you have any suggestions of other cases to cover on this channel? Please write in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and as always, stay safe.